Bonjour à tous dans la vidéo d'aujourd'hui, nous allons parler de la Citroën GS, GS Fantomas et de son rôle dans un célébré film mettant en scène une voiture volonté. No, really, my French is uh, absolutely atrocious, but this car, or should I say, um, anomaly that showed up on the Microsoft Flight Simulator Marketplace is not. Let's get started. So to get started, uh, popping in the interior of this thing, it's a pretty standard uh, Citroen, kind of a French sort of affair here. We have a handy dandy little catalog of all sorts of handy good stuff here. We've got little handles if we need to do some uh, heater management, you know, turn it on. You know, I've got my little wiper controls, you know, in the event that, you know, some uh, nasty rain that hits us or something like that. You know, got this little switch for the battery. I like this little oil level kind of gauge. I mean, you look down here and we have pretty standard instrumentation. As far as uh, weight and balance capabilities go, uh, we should probably put a little more gas in this thing. 50 gallons, man, that's a pretty big tank when you think about it. Some instruments here, we can turn some lights on, we've got a good old analog clock, and everything's looking uh, pretty mundane. As a matter of fact, if I use my left and right feet, you can see that I go ahead and I'll wiggle the little wheel here. You know, if I push my throttle forward, you can actually watch the little gas pedal down there manipulated. And, uh, you know, that seems to be about it. So uh, that's all there is to it. Just uh, this simple little car that we look at. <laughs> Yeah, not really. Let's get this thing started. So first things first, we're going to go turn on the battery. That's all there is. And this little switch is the starter. Put it into gear. And now we're good to go. Ah, so, whoa, excuse me, excuse me. So what we're going to do is uh, this guy over here on the left here is going to be our current RPM. You push the throttle forward, the RPM comes up. Pull the throttle back, the RPM is going to drop down. Over here on the right are these things called kilometers per hour. I'm not sure what a kilometer per hour is. It must be some kind of fancy unit of time or distance or something like that. But as it stands right now, we've got ourselves a perfectly ordinary car. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop it into gear here. I'm going to go ahead and push the accelerator a little bit forward. And now I'm just going to be using my rudder pedal for the purposes of uh, kind of driving around. And uh, you can see uh, we have ourselves lovely Hangar 4 there. And, uh, of course, the plane that I normally fly, somebody already took it out this weekend and be parked right there. And we're just going to kind of do the little driving along the taxiway thing. Oh, man, that's uh, a little irritating. Let me go ahead and see if I can get that out of the way. Hey, get out of my way. There we go. Looks pretty good. I love the little rear view mirror there. I wish it was a little more functional. I wonder who these guys are right here. I'm going to go ahead and play with that a little bit. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, no, don't mind me. No, no, I'm just, I'm a car. <laughs> Definitely a car. There's nothing suspicious about this vehicle at all. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pop on here. Uh, let's get on to Alpha, and then we're going to kind of head our way down to the end of the runway here. Big old two zeros where we're going to be our destination here. That's, oh man, I got to say, this thing is really easy to drive. Like, I mean, none of the airplanes that I normally operate. Whoa, we're drifting a little. Oh, -ho. <laughs> okay, there we go. Man, you can do some mad drifts in this thing. So let's keep on growing here. Oh, we're just going to kind of sneak up here. Here comes Charlie in a moment. We're going to take a right onto Charlie. A lot of times, too, is like I can go all the way down, but I'm not too, too worried about that. Oh, DC-3. I didn't realize they still had that in Hartford. I thought they sold that sucker. So uh, the reason this aircraft, or I should say car, is uh, very, very interesting here is they've added some optional extras, which uh, make it a little unlike uh, some of the other aircraft that I've done tutorial videos on. Uh, namely, if you pull the sucker down, you're going to see this strange little thing here. And um, for one, I've noticed there's a bunch of different instruments up here. I've got myself a little altimeter up here, a vertical speed indicator. I've got something that talks about something called knots. What's that shenanigans? And I've even got myself a um, basically a turn and slip indicator right here. It also gives me these little warnings that says, I need to push these buttons in order to do things. All right, I guess I'll try that. Let's give it a spin. So I've done that. So I'm going to push number two. I'm going to push number three. And I'm going to go ahead and activate this. Oh, turns out this is not just any ordinary Citroen. Uh, this is a highly advanced uh, technical Citroen, which has some extra capabilities. By the way, it also has the world's cutest little wing sitting out the back there, which I don't know, I find that kind of amusing. So we'll keep proceeding uh, down the little runway here, uh, getting ready. And there's one more switch here that says rocket engine start. I didn't know uh, the, you know, the French uh, used uh, rocket engines as standard equipment. Hey, how you doing, buddy? Yeah, good day today. I didn't realize we were using a 2-0 for landing. Uh, I guess I'm just going to have to cut this guy off. So what we're going to do is we're going to tax your way over here again. Uh, don't be too, too hard on the controls. This thing loves to skid. Also, Hartford seems to be missing a hanger. It should be right over there on my left. Going to come uh, swinging over here. Oh, it's looking pretty good so far. Get ourselves lined up here. Oop, I'm collecting a lot of those kilometers per hour down there. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad. Line myself up on this lovely runway. I'm going to try to get as much runway as possible. And uh, we're going to try pushing that other switch and uh, see what happens here. That looks pretty good there. I'll line myself up at the center line. I'll go hit that. I like the parking brake. You actually, you just kind of pull it up, kind of a thing like that. And uh, let's push this button and see what happens. Oh, oh! Will, will it fly? Let's find out. Full power. Yeah, I like how the whole thing's crouching down here and it's like starting to vibrate or something like that. Let's go. 
So while flying this is unlike anything I think I've flown in a while, in a while. First of all, this thing accelerates pretty darn quickly. Second of all, you have to keep this thing doing fighter jet speeds in order to get any sort of stability out of it. You can see um, I'm airborne here, and my first instinct was to slam up the landing gear. But if you actually look out the back there, um, putting the landing gear handle up uh, doesn't do much for you. As a matter of fact, it's uh, just there for your own entertainment. But we can tap the brakes if we want to. So now that we're airborne, uh, we're definitely on our way. Uh, there's some instrumentation on this aircraft to kind of, well, car craft, whatever you want to call it. You can see looking up above our heads, I've got some compass up there. You can see i got my little vertical speed indicator. Also, I have a device that's uh, going to give me a general idea of what my altitude is. Now, there's a couple things that make this particular car a little bit more challenging to fly or drive than a lot of other cars. Uh, first thing you got to keep in mind is our fuel capacity. Um, we have either zero or one fuel, but we also have a one and a half fuel. No, but really, um, we're a rocket motor. We're not like a little propeller-driven dude, so uh, you have to kind of keep an eye on that. That being said, 50 gallons is going to get you probably interstate pretty easily. The second thing you have to remember is because this thing is not very wide, it has a very, very, very low polar moment of inertia. What does that mean for you? That means when you snap the yoke and let go, it's going to keep on going because there's very, very little to resist it. Um, now, some people, of course, are like, well, how strong is the rudder? I mean, you take a look at the rudder out the back there, a little tiny thing. And I'm kicking the rudder right now. And um, you, uh, this is the world's weakest rudder. As a matter of fact, if you want to really stomp on it, you're going to go ahead and get yourself some adverse y'all, which is going to make it extremely challenging in order to navigate. Now, you're probably going, OK, so uh, what about navigational options? What do we got? Well, <sighs> Not gonna lie, you have a compass. Uh, we don't have a GPS or anything on here, which is uh, kind of a bummer, but um, um, we can also overstress the airplane. And really what makes that very challenging is if you do want to go ahead and reduce your throttle to kind of like a cruise throttle like we've got it right now, uh, the issue you're going to have is it's going to be very difficult to keep the nose of this thing up because um, aerodynamically uh, this thing just cannot work. Now the part everybody's probably most curious about with this particular aircraft or car craft or abomination is the fact that this one is capable of landing. As a matter of fact, you've got four really squishy wheels, and you can tell kind of by the orientation and arrangement of those wheels that they're going to be able to give us a pretty good bounce when we hit the ground. The downside is because this thing has such an extreme traveling speed, it makes it very, very awkward to land. Now, one of the things I was experimenting with when I first climbed into this thing was trying to figure out exactly what combination of landing things can you do. Can you do kind of the bicycle landing, which is like a B-52 or B-47? Uh, does this one require a very, very flat landing, uh, you know, like you're trying to do almost like a three-point landing, uh, can you flare the aircraft? And the reality is that the folks who designed this uh, designed it to basically be compatible with all of those landing types, which I was actually very pleased about. The technique that I found worked best is actually the low approach. You know, what I'm actually doing here is I'm making my way up into northern Connecticut as we're just kind of cruising along here, absorbing on the little, little plants here. Uh, what we could have done, of course, is I jumped on the highway real fast, uh, which would probably have been a little bit safer for us, but for the purposes of demonstration. So when you're flying this, so on, just keep in mind that as as you start to slow down, the nose is going to drop on you aggressively, and even with application of maximum um, rocket, <laughs> it may not recover. So uh, make sure you either have the altitude or you do the best you can to try to keep your speed above uh, 180 kilometers per hour. It's really kind of the safest option here. Now, for those of you who have the uh, GTN 750, uh, one of the nice things you can actually do if you have access to it is you can actually open this sucker up during flight. Now, the interesting thing is, and uh, you'll see this in a minute once it opens it up, ah, I have to get the, there it goes right there, is uh, the fact that um, this actually will work, assuming you have your avionics activated. And if your avionics aren't turned on, uh, you won't get much of anything. Yeah, you know, this will just be blank. But notice, at least, I can zoom out, and I still have some capability to like line up with the runway 33 that we're coming up on in just a few moments. And the reason I like this so much, too, is now we have a little digital display, too, if I want to pop out like another screen. It's really nice. You can also use the built-in VFR map that um, Flight Simulator comes with that works well for you as well. Now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this thing a little bit of a nose-up trim here. And of course, um, um, I guess it would be hood up trim, bonnet up trim. I believe, no, the bonnet's the back. Or, no, the bonnet's the nose. I'm right. So we're going to give it some bonnet up trim here, and uh, we're going to continue making our approach. Now, the best strategy I found for this one is, like I said, after experimenting, is you want to come in low and kind of flat. Um, you can flare a little bit, but your wheels are actually really, really strong, and they can absorb these really high-speed landings. Uh, one of the things I was discovering, you can see I'm coming down to uh, 30 units there on the left as I'm slowly trying to get this thing under control. You have to treat this thing almost like landing an F-104. You know, it's the same philosophy. And the other thing for those of you who are big VR fans, this aircraft, um, car craft, is amazing 
with the exception of the fact that um, you're going to be moving pretty darn quick. So just kind of be advised and even lower to the ground than an F-104 because we have to get the wheels to touch and uh, you'll see exactly what I mean on approach. So when we're approaching with this one, I like to back my power back to about 30 units or so there and I'm kind of mounting. Um, don't shut the rocket motor off. Um, that was a mistake I made early on because I'm like, oh, I'll just shut the rocket motor off and glide in. The, this, this doesn't glide. It doesn't. So you can see right there, I've got a one white and three reds, which is actually a pretty good height for us. And again, if we come in a little high, trying to get that nose up is gonna be trouble. Like even now, see how it's starting to wallow a little bit? You can see just how slow this thing starts to get, how difficult it starts to become to manage. Now, part of me is like, oh, why couldn't they've done a less realistic flight model? But the other part of me is like, this is the greatest flight model ever as far as nice and all. You can see how it just kind of wallows. Oh, it's good stuff. I'm gonna back that power out a little bit and we're just gonna kind of make our way down to the ground. Now there's no attitude indicator, so um, how are you going to figure out that we're flat? Now the good news is I am flat. So uh, one of the things I like to do here is if you look at the top of the mirror on my right, you can use that as a horizon reference for you as you're coming in for a landing here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and apply power. If you start feeling yourself running out of elevator, give yourself a pretty hefty blast of power here. And if you feel it kind of a little low, that's fine. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the throttle back and we're gonna wait for the thunk. You don't wanna fight it, you don't wanna pump it. There it is. And we're down. Uh, once you've gone ahead and uh, landed on the ground, you want to make sure you uh, retract your engines. Uh, actually, not retract your engines, I'm sorry. You want to cut off the rocket motor and switch to the regular, you know, uh, four-speed standard kind of a thing. Uh, one thing I did find when I was experimenting with this one as well is that uh, you want to make sure you go ahead and uh, bring in those wings uh, when you do hit yourself on the ground if you want to drive this thing around. Now, I know you're all probably wondering this. It's like, okay, well, that was pretty darn cool. Uh, it seems like it's a practical method of um, something. But um, one of the questions people are going to ask is, what is it like on the highway? Well, now the interesting thing here is uh, because everything in a uh, flight sim is a real size and it's a little realistic, uh, this little kind of uh, strange little undulations that I'm getting as I'm uh, trying to race down the highway here, it's actually a completely uh, realistic to this particular stretch of road. Now, one of the fun things here is uh, when people try to pull out into that and take the left turn and kind of cut across the traffic here, like those people in the other lane, um, uh, dude, d excuse me, so, the, oh, I knew that was going to be a problem. So the biggest problem with this is collision. And uh, one of the things you can do if uh, you're really looking forward to uh, driving this thing uh, dangerously like I am, is you want to remember that you have to stay kind of in the middle of the lane. It's really, really tempting to uh, kind of spread out. But those little invisible wings that we have that were poking out earlier are still kind of there. Uh, the other problem you're going to have uh, when you try to navigate this sucker on the highway is the fact that as you're driving it, um, you're very, very likely to hit bumps that are going to do all sorts of... So oh, there it is again! Uh, give you some issues. So now if this becomes an issue, if you go into your assistance options and you actually come over here and shut failure and damage to easy, what that's going to do is it's going to make it a little less likely to uh, make you absolutely insane here. But what you're going to find is... Uh, let's see if I can get this thing rolling. Ah, uh, there we go. It's going to be a frustrating experience of trying to get this thing on any sort of back road. Now, one of the things I did experiment with in my earlier versions, of course. And now notice, because I've shut failures and damage off, that I can just go under these trees, onto this, oh man. Let's see if we can, get, oh, oh, there's uh, nobody merging. Oh my gosh. Another problem you're gonna have is going to be in control because of speed. Now, one of the things that makes this very challenging and it's built in is as you start going faster in flight sim, you're gonna have less control of the front wheel. Uh, once you exceed about 60 kilometers an hour, you're gonna notice you have basically no control over the actual steering wheel here. You know, you can jam this thing all day. Oh wow, there's nobody, nobody coming? My brain actually instantly, oh, into the woods. <laughs> um, you can see that there is. There's also another problem you're going to have when driving on roads. Yeah, the interesting thing is uh, that that's actually roughly what the Jersey barriers uh, look like in Connecticut here. Oh, boy. And okay. Remember a minute ago I was telling you to go ahead and turn damage off? Um, that's going to create this un interesting unintended side effect that uh, we're going to see there. That's exit 40 on my right. So uh, we're just going to keep uh, ripping down the highway here, and um, we're coming up on the Connecticut River. Uh, the Connecticut River, of course, is you know a lovely place. I can take your speedboats. You know, I've kayaked it a bunch of times as a kid. But there's uh, one consequence. And if you haven't guessed what that consequence is yet, you're going to find out in a second. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, Jersey barriers. Jersey barriers. Now, these bridges are actually going to be solid for us. Now, the nice thing about a nice solid bridge like that is it's going to work. The bad side is this is going to happen because there's very little collision model on a bridge itself. So um, we're going to go swimming if that's cool with you. Wee-hee! Woo-hoo! Yee-hoo! And now uh, we're no longer a flying car. We're now a floating car. 
So as you can see, uh, this is a very, very neat package. I love the way they folded the wings underneath this. And you can see the nice solid bridge here that's a little uh, deformed. I would love to be able to just drive around. Honestly, that should be the next great simulators. Drive Anywhere on Earth Simulator 2025. But this little car on the flip side, absolutely cool. I'm so glad I picked this thing up. And in VR, it is legitimately amazing flying right over treetops with this thing. But other than that, enjoy.